Discovery is setting off on a tour of the transition metals. First, we'll get a bird's eye view of the largest group of elements on the periodic table in Exploring Transition Metals. Then, we'll see how some transition metals are used to make metal alloys in manganese, strengthening steel. Next, we'll learn how one element may hold the clue for what killed the dinosaurs in Iridium, meteor mass extinction. Then, we trace humanity's infatuation with one particular transition metal and see how some modern miners are making a living in gold, wealth from water. And finally, you'll climb aboard an aircraft carrier and get an insider's look at the massive collection of workers, materials, and technologies that come together to create the most powerful ship on the seas in Floating City of Steel. We're taking off with the transition metals, coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. What properties do the transition metals share? How do the elements vanadium, chromium, and manganese affect steel? The elements that are categorized as transition metals are the largest group of elements. They make up about one-third of the entire periodic table. What do you know about the transition metals? Cu copper and Au gold and Ag silver, um, Hg is mercury. The transition metals like copper, nickel, um, they all conduct electricity very well. Transition metals are in the D block of the periodic table and transition metals such as zinc, um, they don't corrode in the air, so they can protect other metals like copper on the Statue of Liberty. Some of the metals in there are like gold, silver, zinc, titanium. The transition metals are one of the largest groups of metals on the periodic table. The transition metals are the largest group of elements in the periodic table. They are generally known for their hardness and their high densities, melting, and boiling points. The group includes the 38 elements from scandium to zinc, yttrium to cadmium, hafnium to mercury, and rutherfordium to anunbium. The transition metals also include the 30 elements that make up the lanthanide and actinide series. But these elements are traditionally considered as separate subgroups. The most well-known transition metals are copper, silver, and gold. People have used these metals to make coins and jewelry for thousands of years. But many other transition metals are also important to society. The elements iron, nickel, and titanium are used in technology production. And many can be combined to create metal alloys that are vital for modern construction, commerce, and industry. The transition metals in general are hard, dense, and shiny. They have high melting and boiling points, and they are good conductors of heat and electricity. As with all metals, most are malleable and ductile, meaning they can be flattened into sheets or pulled into long wires without breaking. Transition metals share many traits, but the properties of individual transition metals can differ from one element to the next. For instance, only copper, silver, and gold are usually found in their pure metallic states. All other transition metals interact with oxygen in the atmosphere, so they're usually found only as compounds. The transition metals iron, cobalt, and nickel are the only three elements known to produce a magnetic field. These differences in chemical and physical properties may be better understood by taking a closer look at the periodic table. 
On the periodic table, the elements are listed in order of their atomic number. The atomic number represents the number of protons in an element's nucleus. In its normal or ground state, this nucleus is also surrounded by an equal number of electrons. As you read the periodic table from top to bottom, each horizontal line is called a period. Each period represents the number of electron shells the element's atoms normally have. For example, four electron shells are in an atom of titanium, so it lies in period four. And an atom of hafnium in period six has six electron shells. The transition metals in period seven are called transactinides because they come after the actinide series. All these elements are radioactive, and they can be produced only under unnatural conditions, such as inside nuclear reactors or high-energy particle accelerators. They are very short-lived. Some last for only seconds. As a result, scientists know little about these elements. As you read across the table from left to right, the vertical lines of elements are called groups. Elements in one group generally have the same number of electrons in their outermost electron shells. These electrons are called valence electrons. It takes eight valence electrons to fill an outermost electron shell and make an atom stable. For most groups on the periodic table, the number of valence electrons an element has corresponds to its position on the table. For instance, hydrogen in group one has one valence electron so it's very interactive. Beryllium in group two has two valence electrons and it's slightly less reactive. Boron in group three has three valence electrons and so on. But the transition metals do not follow this pattern. These metals have valence electrons in two shells instead of just one. Like other elements, the transition metals have electrons in their outermost shell but they also have valence electrons inside this outermost shell in an interior shell called a d orbital. The d orbitals hold between one and 10 additional valence electrons. When transition metals react with other elements, these partially filled d orbital electrons determine how the elements interact. Did you know the transition metals group gets its name from the location of elements on the periodic table. In each of the four periods in which they occur, the transition metals are positioned in the order of increasing number of electrons in the d atomic orbitals of their atoms. In this way, they represent the transition between the group 2 elements to group 13 elements. Adding one metal to another is the process of alloying. Metal alloys combine the desirable properties of each element that goes into them, and they allow builders to make things that are bigger, stronger, or tougher. How can an object's size, density, or toughness be an advantage? The heavier an object is, like, the more hard it is to uh, knock things over. Light things have an advantage because they can move uh, quicker than heavier objects. An animal like a walrus has a lot of extra weight and it's blubber and fat that acts as insulation. Because a building is very heavy, it won't be knocked over by the wind. Cars were built with much heavier metals like steel in the past. Now with today's metals, today's metals like aluminum and carbon fiber, cars are able to have much faster speed times because there's a lot less weight on it. Playing soccer or football or, or whatever can be important in sport. Physical size and stature is you know, key to survival. Element number 25 on the periodic table is manganese. The atomic symbol for manganese is MN. Manganese is a gray-white or pinkish metal that resembles iron, but it is harder and more brittle. Manganese gets its name and atomic symbol from the Latin word magnus, meaning magnet. Classified as a transition metal, manganese lies in the periodic table's fourth row, called period four. Each atom of manganese consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. 
In the most common form of manganese, its nucleus has 25 positively charged protons plus 30 uncharged neutrons. Manganese has 25 negatively charged electrons to balance its 25 protons. These electrons are found in four orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, argon. Argon has 18 electrons distributed among three orbital shells. Manganese has seven more electrons than argon. The first two electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 4s orbital shell. The remaining five electrons are distributed among five clover-shaped 3d orbitals. The electrons in the 3d shell are at a lower energy than those in the 4s shell, so they are actually contained within the 4s shell. As a result, generally only the two electrons in the outermost 4s shell influence how manganese interacts with other elements. In this experiment, manganese dioxide is shown reacting with concentrated hydrochloric acid to produce chlorine gas. This is a standard method of producing chlorine in the laboratory. The chemical reaction involves an intermediate compound, manganese tetrachloride, and water, which then breaks down to form manganese chloride and chlorine gas. The escaping chlorine gas can be seen as faint yellow-green bubbles. This reaction demonstrates the variable chemical states that manganese and most other transition metals can have. Almost 90% of the manganese produced every year is used in steel manufacturing. Manganese is also used to make dry cell batteries, or it's added to paints as a drying agent, or to ceramics and glass to give them a green color. This is a United States Nimitz-class nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. It is the largest, most powerful, and most capable aircraft carrier class in the world. This floating airbase holds 6,000 people and 80 state-of-the-art airplanes. Construction of an aircraft carrier represents the world's most complex shipbuilding challenge. And it all begins with steel. Steel is created by adding carbon to molten iron ore. When iron is heated, the crystal structure of its molecules spread out and can absorb the smaller molecules of carbon. As the iron cools, the carbon is trapped within the iron molecules, creating a much stronger metal, steel. But the steel used for building an aircraft carrier must be exceptionally strong. So steel alloys are used. Metal alloys are combinations of metals and other elements that are engineered to have specific properties that the metals alone lack. The elements chromium, manganese, and vanadium can be added to steel to create steel alloys that improve certain characteristics of the steel. Adding chromium, a shiny, corrosion-resistant metal to steel, creates stainless steel. When the chromium is added to the steel, used in making armor plating for a ship's hull, it bonds with the carbon deep inside the thick plates and makes them harder, less brittle, and more resistant to corrosion. Manganese is an essential element for making steel because it interacts with sulfur. Atoms of manganese have two extra electrons in their outer shell, while those of sulfur lack two. As a result, when manganese is added to steel, it bonds with the sulfur in the mixture to eliminate or reduce sulfur's weakening effects, which makes armor plates stronger, harder, and longer lasting. Vanadium is another important alloying metal for carrier steel. But unlike chromium and manganese, vanadium is not used for making armor plating. Instead, vanadium is added to steel to resist metal fatigue, which is repeated pressure that causes metal to gradually stretch out of shape. Because it is so good at helping steel hold its shape, vanadium is added to crankshafts, gears, springs, and jet engines, where very high strength and abrasion resistance are critical. It takes seven years to build a single Nimitz-class carrier. But when the ship is finally complete and taken to sea, it is one of the most powerful aircraft carriers on Earth. 
and a testament to the ingenuity of its makers and the strength of its steel. Did you know? Iron, the base metal from which steel is made, was first used around 4000 BC. The ancient Egyptians and Sumerians did not know how to smelt iron, so they could not retrieve the metal from iron composites on Earth. Instead, they recovered iron from fallen meteorites and used it to make spear tips and ornaments. About 65 million years ago, a catastrophic event on Earth killed much of the life on the planet. Many scientists believe they have found chemical evidence of what might have caused this mass extinction. What creature would you bring back from extinction if you could? I would bring back a trilobite because it's a cool insect thing that's extinct and used to live in the ocean. I would bring back a woolly mammoth. I think I'd bring back the dodo bird. Probably some kind of dinosaur because dinosaurs are cool. It's pterodactyl so we can study how it flies. A dinosaur like a stegosaurus uh, to see how um, an animal from 65 uh, million years ago would interact with species now. That big shark, the megalodon I think, they're like 100 feet big. A saber tooth tiger. But I think it'd be awesome like to see a saber tooth tiger just you know running around might be kind of dangerous. And I think pretty much everything that's gone extinct is meant to gone extinct. That's the way, way it goes. I'd bring back early man so we can see how far humans have come. Element number 77 on the periodic table is iridium. The atomic symbol for iridium is IR. Iridium is a hard, brittle, yellowish white metal that is the most corrosion resistant element. Iridium gets its name from the Latin word iris, meaning rainbow. Iridium is classified as a transition metal and lies in the periodic table 6 row, period 6. Each atom of iridium consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of iridium, its nucleus has 77 positively charged protons plus 115 uncharged neutrons. Iridium has 77 negatively charged electrons to balance its 77 protons. These electrons are found in six orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, xenon. Xenon has 54 electrons distributed among five orbital shells. Iridium has 23 more electrons than xenon. The first two electrons are found in the sphere-shaped 6s orbital shell. The next 14 electrons fill seven lobe-shaped 4f orbitals. And the final seven electrons are distributed among five clover-shaped 5d orbitals. Since the 21 electrons in the 4f and 5d orbitals have less energy than those in the 6s orbital, the two electrons in the 6s orbital play the largest role in iridium's chemical reaction. Iridium is a precious silver-white metal. Iridium is often used in spark plugs because it is the most corrosion-resistant metal known. Iridium is not affected by air, water, or acids. It is also one of the densest materials found on Earth and has an extremely high melting point. Spark plugs made with iridium-coated tips require less voltage, burn fuel more efficiently, and deliver higher horsepower and better gas mileage. Iridium is most often used as a hardening agent for platinum and to make special containers such as crucibles and other high temperature equipment. Since it is the most corrosion resistant metal, it is often added to hypodermic needles, gold pen points, and spark plugs. It was also used to make the standard meter bar that international measurements are based on. About 70% of Earth's species disappeared in a mass extinction about 65 million years ago. The cause of this sudden extinction, which wiped out the dinosaurs and so many other species, is still being debated in the halls of science. But the element iridium may hold a valuable clue. Professor Michael Rampino and many other scientists believe that this mass extinction may have been caused by a gigantic asteroid striking the Earth. This is the Hoba iron meteorite in Namibia. It's the largest meteorite known on Earth. And like most meteorites, it contains the rare element iridium. And iridium has proven to be the clue, the connection, between the impact event and the extinction of the dinosaurs. 
Iridium was largely concentrated in the planet's core while the Earth was cooling, so it is rare to find Iridium in the Earth's crust. But meteorites often have high levels of this element. As a result, Iridium is often concentrated near impact craters near the Earth's surface. But high concentrations of Iridium have also been found in a layer of sedimentary rock that stretches across the planet. This rock layer has been dated to 65 million years ago. And in 1990, a crater more than 110 miles wide was discovered on the ocean floor off the coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It too was created 65 million years ago. It would take a meteor more than six miles wide crashing into Earth at nearly two and a half thousand miles an hour to form the crater. The impact of such a meteor strike would have emptied the Gulf of Mexico and sent up a ferocious fireball that would engulf the land for thousands of miles around. Scientists estimate that a meteor that large could have contained enough iridium to account for the layer of iridium that has been found encircling the globe. The impact may have had other catastrophic effects as well. The force was so great that shock waves went out from the point of impact in Mexico around the world and focused and concentrated at the exact opposite point of the Earth, in the Indian Ocean. The theory is still being debated, but many scientists believe that the effects of the impact and the volcanic activity it caused poured millions of tons of dust and ash into the air, blocked out the sun, and prevented plants from growing. Nitrogen, sulfur, and oxygen in the atmosphere combined to form acid rain, and the Earth's global temperature cooled. Death swept the planet, and when the skies finally cleared, thousands of species, including the dinosaurs, were gone. Did you know? Most meteors are boulder size or less and burn up as they enter the Earth's atmosphere, forming shooting stars. Although about 500 baseball-sized meteors actually land on the surface of the Earth each year, only a handful of people have ever been hurt by a meteor in all of recorded history. Many of the transition metals are valued for their usefulness or beauty. But one metal has stood above the rest throughout human history, gold. Why do people value gold? It's an elusive thing because of the way it looked. It's shiny. It gave a standardization to trade and to money and probably helped develop you know, what we know today as an economy. It's like diamonds, it's, it's, you don't find it that often. So it's the scarcity of it and the supply and the demand just makes it a good thing to have. Gold has probably caused many wars. Because it's worth a lot. So it's more the non-availability of the gold that makes it so special. Element number 79 on the periodic table is gold. The atomic symbol for gold is AU. Gold is shiny and yellow and it's the most pliable and soft of all the metals. Gold gets its name from the Old English word geolo, meaning yellow. Gold's unusual atomic symbol, AU, comes from the Latin word for gold, aurum. Gold is classified as a transition metal and lies in the periodic table's sixth row, period six. Each atom of gold consists of a cloud of electrons surrounding a compact nucleus that contains almost all of the atom's mass. In the most common form of gold, its nucleus has 79 positively charged protons plus 118 uncharged neutrons. Gold has 79 negatively charged electrons to balance its 79 protons. These electrons are found in six orbital shells surrounding the nucleus, which can be visualized as being built up from the nearest preceding noble gas, xenon. Xenon has 54 electrons distributed among five orbital shells. Gold has 25 more electrons than xenon. The first electron is found in the sphere-shaped 6s orbital shell. The next 14 electrons fill seven lobe-shaped 4f orbitals, and the final 10 electrons fill five clover-shaped 5d orbitals. Since the electrons in the interior shells are at lower energies than the electron in the 6s orbital, 
Only this outermost electron influences how gold interacts with other elements. The 6S shell holds onto this valence electron strongly, so gold is relatively inactive chemically. In this experiment, a small piece of gold is cut from an ingot. Gold has the highest malleability and ductility of any element and is therefore easy to roll and press into very thin wires or sheets. The same small piece of gold can be repeatedly fed through a press until it has been transformed into a large piece of thin gold foil. Gold is a good conductor of heat and electricity. Here, a soft brush is charged with static electricity and lifts an even thinner example of beaten gold, gold leaf. Gold leaf is often used to coat surfaces for decoration or for practical reasons because gold is unaffected by air, water, alkalis, and nearly all acids. Gold is a beautiful and malleable metal that is easy to work with. Throughout human history, it has been used to make coins, jewelry, and other valuables. It is also the standard that many currencies are based on. Because it conducts electricity well and resists corrosion, gold has many uses in electronics and industry. People have valued gold since prehistoric times. Gold may have been the first metal that our ancestors ever used in ornamentation and rituals. Hieroglyphics from as early as 2600 BC describe the use of this shining metal in Egypt. And gold has been valued, sought after, and fought over by people ever since. Gold has always been considered one of the most precious metals. Atoms of gold are extremely non-reactive chemically. Pure gold does not tarnish or rust, and it's unaffected by moisture, oxygen, or ordinary acids. And it is the most malleable and ductile of all metals. A single gram of gold can be flattened into a sheet one square meter. Gold's properties make it an ideal metal for jewelry, ornaments, and coins. Because gold is so soft, it is often combined with other metals, such as silver or copper, to help make it stronger. When other metals are added to gold, the gold content is usually indicated in carats. One carat equals 1 24th part gold. So an object that is 24 carat gold is 100% pure. Most gold that is mined today is not found as large chunks or even small nuggets. Instead, it usually comes in tiny grains or gold dust. The grains are often so small that they cannot be seen by the naked eye so miners must sift through great amounts of earth to find even small amounts of gold. The waters of the Rio Madeira in Brazil flow with gold dust washed into the river from the surrounding soil and rocks. Miners here endure harsh conditions to extract gold from the river. The gold deposits that make their way into the river settle on the bottom as tiny particles. To reach the riverbed, Miners use a motor-driven drill shaft to dredge up tons of silt and stone in an around-the-clock quest for gold. Gold is heavier than most of the other minerals found in the Rio Madeira. So the miners use ridged carpets as gold collectors. While sand and gravel float away, the heavier gold particles sink to the bottom and get trapped. By shaking the carpets through a trough of water, the miners collect gold dust drawn from the river. The gold dust gets heated in a process called smelting to form a small metal patty. After a day of dredging, the miners may collect enough gold to make a patty worth $1,000. They collect the patties and send them to town, where they are melted into 15 ounce bars of gold. The value of this gold bar is about $6,000. It is a long, dirty, and tiring process, but for these miners, the glitter of gold is worth it. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. What properties do the transition metals share? How do the elements vanadium, chromium, and manganese affect steel? 
If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. How do metal alloys differ from pure metals? How do modern aircraft carriers benefit from metal alloys? Our understanding of the elements has allowed us to create new substances and machines that would have been impossible in the past. These technological changes are perhaps nowhere more evident than in our weapons of war. How has technology changed the way we fight wars? They use much more tactical devices, more smart bombs and everything, in place of like a simple just, you know, gun or a bomb that just creates a lot of destruction. I think there are still a lot of guns, they're just more high powered. Tanks that have the like guns shooting out of them. Like machine guns they have and all those missiles they have because they don't really do hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore. They have like those smart missiles. Grenades and bombs and nuclear missiles. There's a lot more chemical warfare. Tanks, bazookas, grenades. Stun guns, tasers also. Uh, GPS guided bombs and there's a lot of chemical, chemical bombs. Smart bombs where they, you know, sort of guide the bomb from the plane. Burning with the fire of the sun, the electric arc furnace renders molten metal. Iron, carbon, and rare metals such as manganese fuse together, chemically combining to form the super tough compound we know as steel. The white-hot metal is extruded into enormous slabs. The rolling mill presses raw steel into high-strength armor plate. These are the bones of the most powerful warship known to man, a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. It takes seven years and more than 30 million man-hours to build a Nimitz-class carrier. With a crew of nearly 6,000, the ship is a mobile airbase for 50 state-of-the-art fighters and 20 support planes. Fully loaded, it weighs 97,000 tons, nearly 200 million pounds. Its four-and-a-half-acre flight deck is as long as the Empire State Building is tall, and it could encompass three football fields. Construction of a Nimitz-class carrier represents the most complex shipbuilding challenge ever undertaken. Virginia's Newport News Shipbuilding Company has been at the vanguard of carrier design and construction for over three quarters of a century. It is the only facility capable of building these mammoth warships. The Harry S. Truman was nearing completion while the Ronald Reagan was at the start of its building cycle. The carrier begins its life as bits of data in a virtual world. Major portions of the carrier's structure and some of its more complex systems are created in the computer as solid, full-size, three-dimensional models. The computer model accounts for every one of the millions of pieces of steel used in these assemblies. 
with the 3D model, we can see the entire arrangement within a particular space. What we try to do is clean the design up, remove any fouls between structure and maybe pipe, make sure that the sailors on board have accessibility, they can read dials, they can get to places they need to without any conflict. We clean the design up long before we get to any manufacturing. With the final design approved, it's time to build the carrier for real. Steel is cut according to plan and the pieces are welded together to form basic structural units. These basic units are combined to form large modules called superlifts. The completed superlifts are lowered into the dry dock and joined together to form the ship. Of course, this is easier said than done. I'm working on CVN 76, which is a Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier. It's a new construction. We get little pieces called base A units from down the road. And it's just like putting a puzzle together. You get little pieces, you weld them together, you make big, bigger pieces, you weld those together and make bigger pieces. The bigger pieces are what I work on, which are the superlift units, and I'm in charge of the structural completion on the superlift units. Uh, this yellow mark right here is just, uh, basically if the weld looks like it penetrates too far into the steel, you have to weld and undercut. So they'll just go back and they'll put another bead of weld there and grind it flush. It takes a crew of 25 working in the various crafts or trades more than three months to complete even one of these gigantic puzzle pieces. We get light fixtures in, we put pipes in, uh, we paint. We've got about eight trades working together out here, and there's so many jobs that go on within the super lifts that you want to make sure the trades are working together and that they're not blocking each other out. So there's not painting going on where welding is supposed to be going on, things like that. When you got the T-bars in here, it's easier to weld all the T-bars straight down the vertical before you put the knuckle plate yes. on, right? Yeah. There's a lot more room to work in there. Right. And then it, you can get some updraft in there, too. The coordination effort is staggering, not only because the enormous ship has hundreds of subsystems, but because all the separately built pieces must eventually fit together seamlessly. So once we make a super lift, it's 900 tons, we'll put it on a crane. Just like a part of the pyramid, you lift the enlarged portion, which is the super lift, down into the dry dock, where we combine all the other super lifts as more puzzle pieces to make what eventually will become the ship. In the machine shop, crews labor to complete the carrier's propeller shafts, which will turn the ship's corrosion-resistant bronze propellers. The shafts must be extremely strong and resilient, so they are made out of aluminum-bearing stainless steel. This shaft section is 66 feet long, 2 feet in diameter, and weighs 52 tons. It will take seven such pieces to make up just one of the carrier's four propeller shafts. The shaft is lowered into a giant lathe for a final machining. The lathe can turn pieces up to 67 feet long that weigh up to 61 tons. Well, this is a stern tube shaft for an aircraft carrier. And I'm machining the groove for the half collars. The sections are installed in pairs. Four of these pairs will be bolted together to form one entire propeller shaft. The piece is gently lowered into the narrow confines of the engineering compartment. The completed shaft must be perfectly straight in order to turn properly. Precise alignment is critical. Twenty-eight 
12 high-strength steel bolts join the sections. The joints must sustain the force of the 80,000 horsepower generated by each of the four engines. Were a joint to fail, the shaft would tear itself to pieces. The resilient element vanadium is often alloyed with steel for parts of this kind. Vanadium gives steel added strength and resistance to metal fatigue. Half a dozen separate sections are now one. Dozens of new superlifts have now been added. The carrier has grown to half its eventual height. Twelve weeks later, the stern section is complete. The 900-ton gantry is the only crane big enough to move it to the dry dock. From 17 stories above, the crane takes up the weight of the 1.5 million pound superlift. With the piece secured in place, an army of welders goes to work. Every mating surface, exterior hull, interior bulkheads, pipes, and electrical conduits are joined. The fire of the welder's torch finally bonds superlift to ship. As the months pass, more pieces are added, 169 in all. The ship begins to take shape. With the outer hull complete, sea valves are opened, the dry dock floods, and the giant ship rises off its keel blocks. Afloat for the first time, it is towed from the dry dock to an outfitting pier, where everything from bunks and toilets to advanced combat systems are installed. One of the most important jobs remaining is the installation of four catapults. These massive steam-powered pistons will literally shoot aircraft off the carrier, accelerating them to flight speed in less than three seconds. The Harry S. Truman is less than a year from completion. On Truman's flight deck, Shielded from the elements and spying eyes in the sky, a crew of 60 labors to install one of the 300-foot-long catapults. Thirty-one hand-cranked winches support a 170,000-pound catapult cylinder. Each synchronized turn incrementally lowers the cylinder. We have to be so careful and keeping the torque and the load on each cable just exactly right. So if one cable breaks, it's just like a set of dominoes, they're all going down. And if these drop, start all over again, guys. Ready, turn. The Navy crew has begun to report on board. The future catapult crew labors side by side with shipyard workers, getting their first introduction to a system they must ultimately master. Well, I think the first one that I worked on was the uh, Nimitz, and I've worked on just about all of them up that, either in the uh, overhauls or new construction. Uh, you, you get to build a system where you actually get to see work. And then, you know, you watch television and the news all over the world and you see aircraft being launched and you know that you were a part of that, you built the system, and it makes you have a great feeling and know that you're doing something which matters.
six weeks later, the installation is complete. It's time to test the catapults. What we're trying to do here today is establish the power curve with the different dead load weights that we can relate that to aircraft, which allows them, when they know the weight of the plane, that they get every plane launched not too fast, not too slow. This is the first time Truman's number four catapult will be fired. Roger, 458 clear. Four, three, two, one, fire! That's great. That was a good shot. Sleds of differing weights simulate various combat aircraft. The testing program goes on for two days. Each sled is launched at a number of different steam pressures and valve settings. If the sled goes off too slowly, steam pressure is gradually increased until the proper launch speed for an aircraft of that weight is achieved. Only four weeks remain before the Truman is scheduled to go to sea for the first time. On board, work reaches a fever pitch as construction crews race to deliver the ship on schedule. All right, here we go. Many of the ship's systems are just now coming online. As work continues, basic supplies begin to find their way on board. The Navy crew is moving in, even as shipyard workers put the final touches on Truman. The result is a chaotic struggle for space amid a tangle of construction equipment. One by one, as spaces are completed, they are turned over to the Navy. It's basically a mess. We're trying to make it, you know, neat so that uh, when the Navy comes, they come through, decide that they want it, or we have to fix you know, what they don't like. When the deadline gets closer, everything gets a little more hectic. You know, maybe looking a lot faster, you know, more people, you know, around you because everybody's trying to get their stuff done. The work must be finished before Truman embarks on builder's trials, the first phase of a strenuous series of at-sea operational tests. Sea trials will be the culmination of the new ship's construction odyssey. Two weeks before departure, reactor officer Andy Pitts and his team bring the ship's nuclear power plant online. The reactor spaces and engine room are classified areas. Only crew members with high-level security clearances are allowed access. The energy produced by radioactive elements housed in two nuclear reactors drives the engines, heats the living quarters, cooks the food, generates electrical power for the weapons systems, and provides high pressure steam for the catapults. The reactors can power the ship for more than 20 years before refueling is necessary. Well, when you're getting ready for sea trials, it's uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You don't have time to turn around. We're into the final phases of uh, making it shine. We've got the last of the testing to go and the painting and the cleaning to make his ship look presentable when we deliver it to the Navy and take it in on his first trial. So right now, if you stand still long, you're gonna get painted. A helicopter touches down on the flight deck. This is the first aircraft to land on the new carrier. As tradition dictates, it is co-piloted by Truman's commanding officer, Captain Thomas G. Otterbein. Yes, sir. Yes, Chief, how are you? Welcome aboard, Skipper. Captain Otterbein is no stranger to flight. A Navy pilot himself, 
he rose to command the prestigious Top Gun Training School before becoming captain of the Truman. What are you out here for? You worried about me? <laughs> After seven years of hard work, Truman stands ready to meet the sea. This Harry Truman is going on builder's sea trials this morning. We've got approximately 30 riggers on the ship, untying the ship so that they can go to sea. I'm the rigger in charge of the cranes down here and cutting the ship loose. I'm going to tie these eyes. I'm going to coil that wire down across the road. On the bridge, the captain and his crew complete their final checks. How are you doing, Chief? Admiral Frank L. Bowman, a former submarine commander, is on hand to evaluate Truman's performance. Is this his lambskin covered <laughs> chair here? Pretty nice, wouldn't you say, Admiral? My golly, day. you don't have that on submarines, you know. We're, no, sir, you don't. We're tough. Diesel oil and stuff. <laughs> it takes these 30 riggers three hours to get this ship ready to go to sea. A rigger, rigger's work is bull work. Officer, home safety. Read you loud and clear. Read you loud. So much jumble. An armada of tugboats surrounds the Truman, holding it to the dock as the last lines are cast off. What's the status on the disconnect of phone lines? Go on. Yeah, go. We're underway. Tugs are working. She's all cut loose from the pier, ready to go to sea trials. One by one, the tugs drop away. For the first time, the Truman is steaming under its own power. The carrier heads for the open sea, ready to face its first great challenge. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. How do metal alloys differ from pure metals? How do modern aircraft carriers benefit from metal alloys? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery look at the transition metals. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library.